we've not done one of these sessions in a really long time. And, and people on the internet often say, yo, we miss your old content. I said, I know, there's this thing, it's called a pandemic. <laughs> we couldn't get together and it caused our business to change. I had to give up this incredible space that we had that we could not use and we had to adapt. And that also changed our team in that everybody scattered like the wind. Uh, people moved uh, overseas, East Coast, they just moved everywhere they could and it was wonderful. But one of the most beautiful things that I get to, to participate in is personal interactive things with people in a real space. And now I'm a person without a space. So it's wonderful to be able to share this room with you and they've been so accommodating here. So it's, it's a big deal for me, right? So the fireside chat, because Mo keeps asking me in the cars, we're driving over trying to keep me awake and I was hallucinating. I was seriously talking to him about Uber drivers and then I started talking about the X-Men and he's like, yo, Dell, what's going on? I'm like, oh my God, I was falling asleep as I was talking to you. It's kind of that thing, you know, driving from the West side over. Um, so he's like, what do we do on these fireside chats? Like, what, what's the topic? What's the format? I'm like, it's fireside. We're supposed to have a conversation with each other. This is not a prepared talk. It's not one of those things that's premeditated. I just talk about whatever I want, but with whatever you want to talk about. So there was from Jordan, you want to do some debate. You know, that's the best stuff. And you do know, you do know, I just want to say this, it will go viral. <laughs> but you don't always wind up on the right side of that viral quotient, but it's cool. Mo knows. Mo has been called all sorts of names. Oh, yeah. yeah, lots of like amazing creative names. Usually like low key. That's a very nice way to put it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Amazing creative names. Yeah. yeah, like low key Drake. We like that, yeah. Can you see? You see what I, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. As soon as I say, you guys in the back, you're like, uh huh. That was pretty dad bod, you know. What I mean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a you know few pounds lighter, but he's whatever, low key Drake. Um, but I would love to have a debate with you because I believe in that friction that exists between two ideas, some form of truth. Like there's my truth, there's your truth, and somewhere in between there's a third truth. And if we can take steps towards each other, we can change a mind and opinion. And I'm always game to have my mind stretched and expanded in new directions. So I'd love to do that. The thing I wanna do is I wanna encourage you all to start with an idea that means a lot to you, that you're super passionate about, that we can go deep on. I also wanna encourage you to push the boundaries because uh, I may not have any, so let's just go there. That we can leave the lighter, more polite conversation to a DM or a, a, a tweet or something. But here, let's take advantage of the fact that we're in this room together. Feel free to say whatever you want. And if you have a problem with what you say, just tell us later, and we'll look at Mo and, and Drigo, and we'll, we'll remove you. <laughs> but I'd rather have the conversation than you worrying about like, oh, am I gonna be embarrassed by this? Chances are yes, but hopefully you'll be okay with it. It's, it's uh, in the, with the idea that we all learn together and sometimes either I'm the fool or you're the fool, one of us will be, okay? And so Mo's going to help us start off, Mo. I, I do want to serve as like a testimonial for the conversations that you can have with Chris. I know sometimes from afar, it can feel very intimidating um, because he's brilliant. But as a person who has had these conversations with him going on three, four years now, it is some have been very hard. And some of them have made me look in the mirror and ask myself questions as an entrepreneur and look at then my business. But if you don't go there, then you're not gonna really get to the truth of what you came here to do. So if we're gonna spend all this time together, just go there, right? And this is communal learning, so he creates safe spaces, so you're in a safe space. But if you just ask a question that isn't specific or, or pertaining to what you're actually going through, he's gonna get you there regardless, but I'm just saying like, be courageous, go there, because the enlightenment you're gonna get from him is gonna be amazing. So I just wanna encourage you to do that. I just wanna say, when he says safe space, he really means semi-safe <laughs> space because sometimes it gets violent. I'm just saying. And we can have fun. It's true, right? And we'll just go there. Uh, but if we do it in the spirit of trying to help each other, then it'll be fine. Yeah. So let's just kick it off. We'll just start the whole thing. All right? Yeah. So, so, Mo, go ahead. Yeah, today uh, I had the privilege of being in the room with him while he was having a conversation with a, a very successful entrepreneur who took a business from $3 million to $60 million in the span of a few years. And as the dialogue was being had between them, Chris was like, hey, I'm gonna poke the bear a little bit. And from what you're saying, it sounds like it's very easy for anyone, if you're in the United States, to make six figures. And I'm sitting there like, how dare you just say that word? Mm -hmm. So I really wanted to start us off because I know many people can be challenged with 
whether it be lead flow or acquisition or business development, um, and actually generating that kind of capital. What prompted you to say that and believe that it actually is easy for someone to make six figures? What do we not know that you apparently know? To make this as interactive as possible, I'm just curious how many people feel that that's possible in America it's relatively easy to make six figures, $100,000 or more. Okay, so not everybody. I would say a little bit more than half. I would say about 60%. You read in the room that same way? Yeah. So before I get into it, I would like to hear from the 40%. Yeah. So whoever wants to kind of voice an opinion, this is opinion-based, right? So just gesture, Mo will throw a mic at you, and then we can talk about what your opinion... Okay, already? <laughs> okay, Jordan, go ahead. I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get rid of my mic too. Just because the next person, then you can okay. pass it back into them. Okay, go ahead. I'll keep it simple. If it was easy, everyone would do it. Okay. So the, the question is, do you really want it? Because some people say, I want to make a million dollars. Some people say, I want to make $10 million, but that's just an expression of an idea. The question is, do you want it? And what is the underlying layer of what you have to achieve and be able to do and transform? It's true. There's lots and lots of people in America, obviously, who are not making six figures. So we have to separate the people who really want it or who are just saying it, and then we kind of dive a little bit deeper, right? When we say easy, meaning there is plenty of resources for you to be able to make that. I'm going to set up the argument, and then I'd love to hear some counter opinions, okay? Um, recently... Uh, for the first time in my life, I was picked up by like uh, a black car driver. He wasn't black, but it was a black car, and then there was a driver. And he picked me up from Pasadena and drove me to San Diego, and I was driving in his uh, 7 Series BMW, one of those newer ones, having this whole conversation with him. And I assumed it was not his car, because what, what is a guy with a 7 Series BMW? I know it's expensive. It's probably eighty to $120,000, depending on the model and the accessories that you get with it. And he goes, no, it's my car. Relatively young guy, I want to say he, or, uh, uh, late 20s, um, the oldest, like barely 30. How is he able to buy a 7 Series BMW and to be able to drive? And we had this conversation. It was quite enlightening to me. Now, what this CEO who told us he's not really good at building businesses from zero to a million, but he's really good at helping uh, businesses go from seven to nine figures because he's mostly an operations guy. He's like, you all come up with the idea. That's the creator role. And to get to a million, he's like, that's your magic. My magic is take that and scale you and just pour gasoline all over your business and figure out where you really need to go. So let's forget for a minute the seven to nine million, because that's a big jump there. Let's just put that to the side. We'll deal with like getting from zero to six figures to a million, okay? So he says, Chris, that's your zone of genius because he's like, in my sleep, I can help companies get from seven to nine million. And I believe him. He does this, and this is who he helps. And I said, well, pardon me, but I believe in my sleep I can help folks get from zero to a million. So then we just focused on this six-figure part, just scale it down a little bit. So here's what this driver told me. He said, the first thing I did was I leveraged, I borrowed to buy the car. Because in order to drive for this company, you have to own a 7 Series BMW. That's their, their baseline. So he bought it, and I said, this is incredible. He said, I paid it off in seven months. And depending on how much I work, I can do $120,000 to $230,000 a year. I thought that was pretty remarkable. This is an unskilled thing. Like you can argue with me that it requires skill to drive a car, not to crash it. But other than that, most of you know how to drive. Most of you can go from point A to point B, get somebody there safely, right? And be polite. That's what these guys do. And so I wasn't 100% convinced until I took another driver back from San Diego to Pasadena, talked to him, he made even more money than the first guy. And he called the first guy lazy. He said, he's only doing 120, it's because he don't want it, right? And what I figured out, what I've learned is this, like why or how is it possible these drivers can make so much money? It turns out there are relatively rich people in this country that don't like to fly. That they'll pay $3,000 to drive from San Diego to San Francisco. You could buy a pretty decent ticket for that, but they just want to drive because they want the convenience and their perceived safety of driving in a car. So it's kind of wild to me. So I was thinking, you don't even have to have skill, but you have to have capital. Well, Mo says, hey, Chris, that's privilege, though. How do we even have that information to begin with? Because I didn't know about this business. I didn't know this was possible. So there's information. 
To which I said, look, we live in 2023. If information is your reason for not getting six figures, then you really don't want it. Where almost everything you want to know is readily available for free or next to free, there's a huge problem. I talked to my friend, her name's Dr. Christine Lucer, and she teaches at the Myrna, Myrna School. And she said, universities used to be the centers of knowledge, but knowledge is free. So what, what is the role of the university now? Do you know what the roles of universities are now? Anybody, like, especially the Ivies, where you're gonna pay a lot of money? Prestige? Network. Networking. Networking. Networking, prestige. So she said, they're just curators of the knowledge. Because there's so much knowledge that we don't know what to do, right? And then most like, but Chris, I don't even know if you grew up in a certain family, if you would even know the questions to ask. Are you, are you with me here? You feel that? Okay. So I said, like, you might not know to ask, how do I buy a 7 Series BMW so I can drive for one of these black car services? Yeah, I understand that. But if you could type in Google, how do I make six figures without a college degree or any skill? What are the top 20 things I can do? I'm pretty sure if Google didn't know, ChatGPT for sure will know. So now I go back to Jordan and I say, Jordan, do, you re do those people really want to make this or this just a pipe dream? So you're telling me people want to be low income? They don't want to, but they don't want to do what's necessary to achieve whatever it is they want in life. I'll give you an example right now. I mean, I'm not gonna call anybody out in the room. How many of you is like, I want to be in the best shape of my life. I want to be the best partner to my wife, husband, or lover, or whatever. But do you put in the work? Do you go to relationship therapy? Do you read the books? Do you hire coaches? Do you work on it actively or you just say, I want it? And now we know the answer, right? Because not everybody here, including myself, is rocking a six pack, <laughs> right? I'm working on it. I really am, right? Mo clearly it's not. I'm just messing around with you all. <laughs> this is where it gets violent. <laughs> semi safe, semi safe. Semi safe. Semi safe. Yeah. yeah. So you see what I'm saying? I would say that's true. People are in love with the result, but not in love with the work it takes to get there. Absolutely. I think they're in love with the idea of the result, not even the result. Mm. Okay. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Right. So we have a. Mm, a, a, a doubter. No, no, not you. We'll go to her first because she, she wants to argue. It's not. I'm, What's your name? Robin. Robin. I'm actually going to say, I don't think it's easy. I think it's simple. But there is a difference. Simple is just you figure out what works and then you multiply it. Right. But that's not easy to do necessarily. And what you're talking about is, are you, are you willing to sacrifice so I, I happen to believe that you don't, you can have both, but not everybody gets it in the time that they want. Not everybody gets it the way that they want. So you have to define for yourself, like, what am I willing to give up in order to get to that six figures? That's fair enough. So do we think your degree of willingness to sacrifice equals your desire to achieve said result? I mean, I think that's going to be true at every level. Like, so what you, what you do to get to six figures is not going to look the same as what you do to get to seven to nine. Absolutely. But right now, if we just focus on the six part, because I think yeah. in America, it's relatively easy, relatively easy to earn six figures if that's what you want. And want is a condition of how much sacrifice, because you have to give up something that you have to get something that you want. I don't personally feel that privilege is to do with information. I think that privilege is to do with risk. Do we have agreement on one thing before we try to tackle the next thing? If a person, not you specifically, if a person says, I want to make six figures and they're not really making progress towards that, maybe it's a, one metric of many is sacrifice. Are you willing to sacrifice? Are you willing to hit the gym when no one's there? Are you willing to give up carbs and rice and whatever it is and sugar? and alcohol if you want to get that body, right? Yeah. And, and we can say that then. Then the next part of the equation is then risk. How much risk do you want to take on? Okay, so then I, I enter this idea from Peter Drucker, legendary management uh, consultant, advisor, guru, who said that in business all profit comes from risk and your ability to take risk, to embrace risk, is the amount of 
reward that you'll receive. And we can understand that in the market, right? If we make an investment in a mutual fund or something super safe and secure, a bond or something, a government-backed thing, the amount of money, the return on investment is gonna be relatively small, but we're not gonna put our money at risk for the most part unless the whole country goes down. But if we put our money in say like crypto or NFTs, high risk, high reward, mostly risk, and we can, we can see that, right? Okay, so then risk, and I don't wanna debate with you because I might agree with you that everybody has a lot of other circumstances around how much risk they can tolerate, right. okay? Now there's the amount of risk uh, that you can't tolerate because of where you're born, whatever conditions, and there's a certain amount of risk you can't take because of the decisions that you make. So if we separate the ones that you have control over versus the ones that you don't have control over, let's focus on the ones that you have control over because those are the ones you can change. For example, if you're visually impaired, if you're, uh, you have any limbs, I mean, we're working against a lot of things here to try to get you somewhere, although we've seen super successful people excel in those spaces too. So what kinds of things do we have control over that maybe we can examine deeper, Robin? Um, this isn't for me specifically because I've already made it to six figures and beyond. I'm more in that second camp, but I'm saying I just wanted to project my point of view because I felt differently about my experience and I thought that might resonate with other people. So if you were to speak for people who, if you can just imagine if they were in that space where they can't take on the risk, what would they say? The things that they can manage, you know? Because I would say if you started a family, that was your decision. Yes, but I don't think that should preclude you from starting a business just because you've- Absolutely not. It's just you've decided to take on more challenges and that's okay. Right. Like if you had to take out a loan, you decided to take a loan versus grind it out for 10 years, save up enough money, and then delay the entry into entrepreneurship until then. And those are all decisions. So if you can try to project or imagine what those responsibilities or things that you have control over that would reduce your tolerance for risk. Do you, do you know anything off the top of your head? Some of it has to do with not necessarily just information and whether you have privilege, but also were you brought up with that kind of mindset? Like when you brought up with a mindset that makes you feel like you can, you can do anything you can, so, like it goes a different way. It goes to a different place than just risk. If you aren't, you know, cultivated in an environment where you felt like you could do that, then you're also, you're challenging that way too. So like there's several different things in there that I think, again, comes back to my, my point of view of it's simple, it's not easy. Because you might have a lot personally that you have to get through in order to get to that point. I'll agree with that too. What do we do about that though? I have to find the right <laughs> opportunities. Work, I guess. You have to find the right opportunities? Yeah. Can you expand on that? Yeah, because you can take as much sacrifice as you want. You can have the right mindset, but you have to have the wherewithal to see the opportunity and seize it. Okay, that's great too. So the opportunity, um, I, I think everybody thinks of opportunity as something that comes in a golden bow wrapped, delivered to you so you know it's an opportunity. But oftentimes opportunities are not self-evident. Right. How do we identify that? Do you have any clues as to what opportunities look like? Yeah. I'm curious. For example, because um, before I was a full-time real estate agent, I was a freelance creative. And when that first client throws you a bone of a project and you knock it out of the park and they go, wow, you really blew me away. Well, now I'm going to give you more. That's a perfect example of an opportunity to seize it. And then they give you more and then they give you more. Then you get the referral and you keep growing, you learn to adapt and seize that opportunity. And then you go, what did I do for this client? Then you take that, maybe I can do this for this next client. Okay, this is interesting to me. Um, I think if each and every single one of you were handled, handed an envelope that said opportunity, please pursue, most people in the right state of mind would pursue. But unfortunately, most opportunities don't come like that. They come like there's problems, there's a problem client, there's a difficult challenge, uh, there's things that are pulling against your time and your energy and your focus, and they don't look like opportunities at all. So what I would love to just talk about for half a second is, what do they really look like? And at some point down the line, they become the opportunity that you're talking about. Yours sounded like an opportunity that began and just blossomed into a bigger opportunity, right? 
Right. Yes. So I'm curious there. I mean, does anybody have any thoughts on that? I'd love to have a discussion about that. All right. Why don't you go and then we'll go to the back. Okay. Uh, my name's Alex. Um, I think the opportunities are usually super frustrating because um, it's like at my company, I supervise a design team. And one of the things we had to cross a bridge on a long time ago was like communication and coordination is freaking super difficult. And now we have additional teams that have come on board and I have seen like this opportunity is we need to extend good systems out throughout the company. But basically like nobody else cares that stuff is sloppy because they haven't like scaled their teams enough to run into those problems. But I'm pretty convinced that that's an opportunity for me and for the whole company that if we fix it, we'll be like three to five times more effective at what we do. But it's literally been like months and months of just debates and arguments and negotiations day after day about it. And I think that's probably what a lot of opportunities look like because you've scoped them out before another person has. Okay, I hear a couple different things here. Number one is, and correct me if I'm wrong, Alex, is oftentimes opportunities look like problems. Yeah. Would you guys be okay with that? Yeah. And I think the bigger the problem, the bigger the opportunity, the smaller the problem, the smaller the opportunity. If somebody has a tumor in their brain, that sounds like a really big problem. Hence, brain surgeons probably charge you quite a bit to solve that problem. The second part that you mentioned is foresight. Like to be able to see something that no one else has seen yet and to have the instinct, the experience to recognize, I think this will pay off in three, six, nine weeks, months, years in being able to do that. Because if you look at the history of Amazon, they were not profitable for decades before they were super profitable. And then at one point, Bezos became the richest person in the world, right? So he saw an opportunity and moved quickly. And same with eBay, and same with PayPal and all these things, right? So maybe we are now starting to recognize something. And I think Mark Manson, who wrote in his book, The Subtle Art of Not Giving an F, he says we should not wish to not have problems because all our life we will have problems. What we should wish for is to have higher quality problems. And he argues, and he's just kind of making a, like a, a dramatic argument for this. He says a homeless person and a billionaire have the same problem with money. One has not enough, one has too much. But one has a much higher quality problem. And so it's kind of like, uh, and if you look into some Eastern philosophy and religion, it's, a re it's like our denial of problems which cause sadness. It's like we can just embrace that life is hard and is full of challenges and just say that that is the nature of life and living, then we become more at peace. Maybe? All right. So then if we can agree temporarily, everybody, that problems are opportunities in disguise, I'm going to ask you the question right now, which is, is AI a problem? Yeah. It's great. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. So depending on how you look at this, we just said problems are opportunities. The bigger the problem, the greater the opportunity. I was speaking in the UK and I was hanging out with Daniel Priestley who wrote the book Oversubscribed and Key Person of Influence along with a couple other books. And he was addressing a room full of people and he said, and they asked him, what are your thoughts on AI? He says it's probably one of the greatest uh, driving factors of, of trillion dollars of new uh, wealth. He says the problem is it would not be distributed evenly. And that hit the room hard. I think if you could go back in time and Bezos was raising money and said, I have this problem I'm trying to solve, how many people would see that as an opportunity versus a problem? And do you know there's like a third founder of Apple that sold his stock? And it's nuts that they did that, did not see the opportunity in that. That one's gonna go down in history as like one of the craziest blunders in financial investment, right? So let's stay on AI for a second. So AI is a problem. The question is, do you see it as a problem or do you see it as an opportunity? And what can you do about it? I know it's a hot topic. We're doing probably this for the clickbait value. So just full disclosure and transparency there. What are your thoughts? What are you doing with AI? How are you responding? You said, how are we using AI, correct? Well, first, what, what kind of problems does AI present to you, a problem? And then how are you responding to that? Um, I don't feel quite, I don't feel threatened by the AI and it's because, you know, I have a lot of Eastern philosophy in what I do with mindfulness. So I see it as in the beginning, it was a problem because I was like, how the hell do I use this? The problem was a, was a learning curve. 
but how I'm using it, it's become like an office buddy as a solopreneur. It's helped me create more content. It's helped me write newsletters, all the mundane copyright stuff that as a creator, as someone who's being creative, I don't want to be bogged down in. So I write up a rough, whatever the thing is that I'm trying to create. And I say, Hey, check this out, make it informative, make it at this learning level, all the amazing prompts, right. That we learn how to do, but it's freed up a lot of time for me. But in the beginning, it took up a lot of time to learn how to use it. Yeah. And when we say a lot, let's put that in context. Because we, we use kind of sometimes vague language. When you say a lot, what are we talking about? Like years? No, I spend hours. I yeah, okay. Say. It's a couple hours. Yeah. Really, that's what we're talking about, right? Yeah. Okay. I, I love how you talked about it, Melanie. So your office partner, your creative muse, uh, your, your, your chef, like you're like the sous chef. Let me prepare all the ingredients. Yo, make me a great omelet. Make me a lobster bisque or whatever it is. I'll just give you the raw stuff. How many people use AI like in that way? Like to help you. Yeah. You just jam a lot of rough, ugly stuff and it comes out like, well, that's not too bad. It might not win a writing award. It might not replace an ad agency copywriter, but it gets you pretty close. And if that is as good as you need to be, it's pretty darn good. If I can get 80% of the output by putting 20% of the effort, then I'm going to get a higher ROI on my time. Okay. Now, oh, remind me your name again. Nathan. Nathan? Okay. Nathan, are there creatives in this room? Raise your hand. Creative people. Okay. Creative people want to kill you. Because the death of good design is stopping at the 80%, right? So if you put effort into it and it's good enough, but we need to help the creative folk around this topic, right? So let's toss it over to the creative person. It's like, man, this is why design sucks. This is why websites suck. This is why video sucks. This is why animation sucks. All right, let's, can you throw all the way in the back there? Yeah. My name is Miles. Miles, I'm a creative director. I'm a floating creative director. So I work for a lot of different agencies. I view this more as a threshold opportunity or problem. We're not really there yet, but a lot of people are projecting forward. So we see a lot of the doom and gloom, and then we see a lot of the fanboys at the same time. It's not really there yet, but for me, the largest concerns are ethics. And something that I feel is encroaching in the creative field is technology in a sense, because it's starting to lead a lot of people rather than the opposite, where creative would lead the tools to betterment. So that's where I do see it as a problem where people feel that they're on par with creative minds simply because they can push a button or put a prompt in. That's one of my biggest issues. And also it's, you know, that some of these platforms have terrible terms of service right now. So, you know, even if you think you're putting something in, you don't own it anymore in a lot of cases. So you have to be really careful and judicious with how you spend your time. So, the, you know, it does feel like there's some encroachment, but I don't feel like it's at a particular place right now, as long as the conversation going forward is one of more ethical boundaries. All right, so which one do you, do you want to like fight over a little bit more? And we could, we could open it a little bit more. Is it that AI has leveled the playing field for non-creatives? Is it who owns this? And are we using materials that are not Mm, like ill-gotten gains, right? Or is there some other ethical dilemma that we need to talk about? Which one hits home for you the most, Miles? I'd say it's the ethics question is, is the largest one. Which part of the ethics? Uh, there's there's just so many variables. Fifth one. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I would say it's your, your ownership of it versus, you know, large companies. Like you're, you're fighting for that place sometimes with, um, you know, what you put out there um, with things that are not necessarily on par, but, you know, they're, they're being put out there as being owned. Give me, a, give me a specific example that hits home for you, please. Well, uh, there's a lot of evidence pointing to, um, well, even Zoom, for instance. Uh, now, whatever you put into a conversation is able to be taken by them and used in perpetuity. So this is not you know, something that's very good for a creative who's coming up with an idea, for instance, that could possibly be taken and just used. They don't have an NDA with us, for instance, so. You're talking about Zoom? The Zoom is just one platform, you know, any... Okay, let's stop there. Mid-journey, you know. Well, you prefer... I didn't even know Zoom was AI. No, no but the, the, actually, speaking of terms of service, they just changed it. So that is one of the things that's... Let's, look, can we stick to AI? Yeah. yeah, let's stick to AI. Sure, mid-journey. Mid-journey. Sure. What's your example? Expensive, you know. 
What's that? What is your example specifically of the ethical dilemma of ownership over mid-journey and you? Oh, because as a creative, if you put something in, um, it's not really yours. It, I mean, unless you, you know, pay that extra, you know, it's really a public thing, but it can be used by someone else and claim to be theirs, actually. Okay. So that's a problem. What did we put in? Uh, we put in our ideas. Words? Sometimes, yeah. A string of words. Prompts at this right. Point, so, yeah. So do you want to be able to own the chain of words that you put in? No, it's not okay. about patenting something, but I think that there needs to be a safer context for people to put out things and have it move in a direction that they would be interested in rather than it just being taken and you know claimed to be one's own. Mm. Okay, I'm curious. If Midjourney came out with one uh, like standalone application that you can download to your desktop that's walled off from the internet, so whatever you produce, no one knows about. If they want to reverse engineer, they could still do that today, but at least there's some level of privacy and security for you. Would you like that option? That seems like fair. As a Would you pay for that option? Around. Sure. And how much is that worth to you to have that level of privacy? Now we come into another issue here, because money talk. That's true, that's true. Because you know, 30 bucks a month ain't too bad for me. As soon as they charge $1,000 a month, like, nah, you take my privacy. I'm okay with that. They do have that option with yeah, they $50 do. or so or whatever it is that you use. Yeah, so that, the, yeah. there is a solution in place. And so this is where it gets real interesting, right? As, as creative people, I think more creative people on the planet feels good to me. Democratize this stuff. Don't make us feel like we're the, the ostracized weirdos in the room. We should all speak the language of creativity because the wicked problems we face in the 21st century need more creative thinking all around. Yeah. And the more people that become aware of art, design, poetry, cinema, animation, I think that's a good thing for us. So a lot of people fear that AI is going to replace a lot of jobs. It will replace some jobs, but it will create a lot of opportunities for new kinds of jobs, yeah? And I give you this example, and I'll say this, okay? Um, Blair N said that all strategy is autobiographical. So I admit everything I say reflects my own beliefs, and so you guys can argue with that. It's not like I'm studying a thousand people, I'm just telling my own experience. I use AI, Midjourney, quite a bit. And I decided to generate ideas for a poster, which I was like, wow, this is really cool. And it got some people excited about it. So what I did was then I hired a, a, an illustrator to go ahead and say, like, I think this is a viable concept, something I would have not have done in the past because to get the idea out there it would have cost me too much money. Turns out nobody bought the posters, so that's a new story. But I did spend money on a real human to make something that I wouldn't have if it wasn't for Midjourney. So that's what I put out there. Now I know a lot of designers are afraid, like, whoa, uh, Midjourney will design a logo. If you compete with a robot who designs a logo for you, I don't think you're competing at all. Some thoughts on this, okay? Um, I, I like to ask for you to think about, does it pass the human test before we pass the AI test? Are humans doing this and you've turned the other eye and we've been doing this maybe forever? Still like an artist? We don't even have to go that far. Like, I didn't create the words that I use. And in school, you read the works of masters and you learn to draw and paint to try to copy the masters. And the closer you are at copying the master, the more skilled you can argue that you become. And I'm gonna just tell on myself right now, full confession, I've looked at many works and we've all called this inspired by, and that's not really what we're trying to do. If I'm inspired by a work from David Carson or Neville Brody or, uh, Joseph Mueller Brockman, I'm literally trying to see like what is the relationship I draw grids over. I'm doing things that I'm not even sure AI is doing. My, my brother's in software development, he explained to me, which I still don't fully understand how it works, it's not the way you think it works. Like the way it generates an image isn't looking and copying pixels. It diffuses the whole thing and it tries to like, what is this? And then there's a teacher robot and a student robot and a judge robot and they start talking to each other so that it can create. Because duplication is easy, creation is very difficult. And so I had this really wonderful discussion with the department chair of the master's uh, design program at the School of Visual Arts. He said, I did a six, eight month deep dive on this subject. I've read the papers. I've concluded AI is doing nothing different than deep looking, which artists have been doing for centuries. I'm cool with it. What we need to do is we need to arm our students to be able to use the tools and integrate into the workflow to know when they need to insert creative influence, curation, direction, and they need to learn their art history and their design history and make good decisions. So we get into this whole thing. Can you pass your own test for AI? It's like we're in the replicant uh, universe of, of Blade Runner now. If you can pass a test, then I say, well, let's not be hypocritical. 
Humans have been doing this. And in fact, you might have gone to one of your uh, designers and said, this I like, make something like this for that client. And they're going to try to do that. We don't turn ourselves in. We're not calling the intellectual property police on us. We wouldn't do that. Because why? Because we're human. I think that's the only thing. So now I'm just saying this. And no, it's not a real term. But it's like you're being an AI racist, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> you are. We didn't like that when it's been done to other groups and minorities, you know? And my wife always laughs at me, guys. You guys need to know this about me. There could be a story about humans dying, and I don't cry. But when the robot gets killed <laughs> trying to help people, I'm like, oh my God, how did they do that? Why would they do that? It was, it was just trying to help you. You just don't understand them, you know? And my wife's looking at me like, what's wrong with you, baby? I'm like, you don't understand. It was innocent, it was like a baby. <laughs> trying to help the stupid humans, let them die. You know what I'm saying? So we gotta really get into that. I love having this kind of debate, but I ask you all, you know, before you wanna throw the stone, look at yourself, look at what you've done. Do we wanna spend it fighting arguments that we cannot win, that we can't change? Or do we wanna use that energy like Melanie and spend a lot of time hours trying to improve her workflow. That's what I want to think about. What I love about AI, many, many years ago, years ago, this is not even AI. I forget the name of the software, but it came on a CD-ROM. That's how old you know it is. It was a brainstorming tool where it was building clusters of words. As a student in 1994, I was loading this into the computer, 95 maybe just typing in words and it would give clusters. And I would go down this rabbit hole and every once in a while it would produce a word or a phrase. I'm like, ooh, I didn't think about it like that. This is like the dawn of the internet. Now you have crazy tools like this all the time. And it was like mind mapping it was beautiful. And I thought, wow, it's helping me to think. I think that's a pretty cool thing. So I was talking to Mo about this. Some of us hate AI for lots of different reasons and I think you have a right to. And I think we're just a complicated algorithm we don't understand yet. And so when it's, it's seeming like so easy for a guy like Nathan to like punch in things and get an image that's decent for him, we, we kind of bristle at that and say, that's a horrible thing that you're doing. It's unethical. How dare you? But you know what? I'll say this to you right now. Nathan, I think, this is my theory. He's Nathan, right? Nathan is not your client right now. But one day, when he sees the difference between an image that starts to trigger a financial response that's positive, he is a smart guy. He will spend money where he makes money. Until he sees that he can make money here, he will not, and that's okay. There will be people like me who will want to give you money, people at the Eisenberg Group who will give you money to do what it is that you do. We can't confuse these two things. And I think more potential buyers in the marketplace will be a good thing. It's just going to be ugly for a while, right? But please, like when people are like, how do I compete against Fiverr? How do I compete on Upwork? I said, friend, if you're on a Fiverr and Upwork, you're not competing. I promise you, you are not. Okay, sorry if I insulted some people in the room. You have to elevate yourself. You have to learn how to market and develop relationships with real people and not rely on the marketplace to determine your financial future. We understand that, right? Okay, so let's, let's just quickly recap a couple ideas. Opportunities never look like what they're supposed to look like to us. They really aren't. It's somebody saying, hey, I got this weird startup company and I need some help with something. And you look at the person in their eyes and their soul and you're like, there's a good human being in there and I think I can trust them. Yeah, I'll help you out for 200 bucks and you help them out and they're actually good for their word. And they give you a, uh, some kind of stock in their company and it grows and it, it's an opportunity. What we have to do is we have to be better judges, I think, in looking at the character of the person versus the actual quote unquote opportunity or obstacle, right? I bank my entire career on making better bets than bad bets, okay? Like a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, there's a young man and his name was Eric Eisenberg and he asked me to work on some logo animations for a company called Red Orb and we barely knew what we were doing. They were in the gaming space. I'm like, I love games. I don't care what you pay us, let's do it. 20 years later, I'd like to consider Eric a friend. He's the person who's one of the founding partners of this incredible space and agency that we're in. So we make good bets, and sometimes we make really bad bets too. We really do. So I'll just tell you a little philosophical thing, and then we're gonna pivot to the next thing. So start thinking about the next thing you wanna talk about, okay? Um, my wife says, it's hard to be around you, honey. I'm like, how come? I mean, tell me the many ways why it's so hard to be around me. Let me take some notes. She goes, because you're so freaking judging. 
You just judge and criticize people all along. And I can't stand it because I hate those people now. How is it that you can still maintain a relationship with people that you're just trash talking all the time? I said, I can observe acutely and be super critical and yet put those judgments aside and still hang out with people. And she can't figure this part out. She just cannot figure this out. And she goes, do you realize what you're doing? You're surrounding yourself with people that are not good, potentially. I said, I know, because I want the person to reveal themselves to me as early as possible. I put myself out there with an open heart and to try to be generous. And some people take advantage of me. And I thank myself and them for that revelation. I said, in the history of our company, in the history of our company, how many times have we been cheated and felt like somebody robbed from us? And she thought, she goes, not many. I'm like, how many? She said, zero times. Because if you leave the door open to your, to your vault, to, and you leave your money on the table, whoever wants to steal, I say, take it. I don't care. Take it. Because now I know who you are. I'd rather not hide the money and then later on find 20 years later it was like 20 year con. Now I have friends that are business people that have been conned, like the first three partners they had, ripped them off, stole their money. And I was like, why does it happen to them and not us? We've been in business now for almost 30 years because they're not very careful at looking at people. They're not very careful at opening themselves with limited amounts of risk so that those people can reveal themselves. I say to my wife, I say, if they want to take this $5,000 or $10,000 opportunity from me, fine. That was really cheap because I would have given you millions. So take it, reveal yourself. And so this way I'm able to mitigate. So when we look at problems and opportunities, I think I have a pretty decent track record, not a perfect one, but I want people to show them, show their true face. And if you are in that situation, what they say is trust someone when they show you who they are the first time. This is the part that we're kind of foolish. We're not critical enough. We're not looking carefully. And so we don't see that. And so I think some of you might see problems as problems and not as opportunities. Or you give yourself too willing to, to people all the way and you don't realize what's happening to you. And so I can't tell you there's a formula or an algorithm for this, but I know in my life, this has worked out really well. Judge the character, not the actual opportunity you see. Some you'll lose, but you'll win more than you lose, and I think that'll be okay. Sometimes I find that there's a problem in actually discovering what that problem is, because you know when you come to the table, you want to put out something, you don't want to spend a lot of time writing proposals that are going to go nowhere, but it's not always easy to see because a lot of companies want to cover that because it's, it's easier to look smiley. So how do you tend to discover what that actual problem is that they would like to solve, not just like, hey, you know, let me make a new identity for you because they may not care. As many of you have witnessed yourself in your DMs all day long is someone pitching you something. And you know what's worse than them pitching you something? Is if they insult you first and then they pitch you something. Like, I looked at your email, it's pretty garbage. We think we can improve it. Like, goodbye. <laughs> That's no way to do it. How do you even know I care about this? You know, we saw your uh, videos. They need better subtitles. That's why they're not performing well. Block. So let's not start there, okay? Let's start like how we do with everybody. Have a conversation, understand them. And you should spend some time, if you want the relationship, you need to make an investment of your time and energy into discovering who they are and seeing if you can begin a natural relationship with someone, okay? I'll, I'll give you guys a pretty easy hack here, okay? And I'm gonna put anybody who is in a category like, man, I need some clients like right now. So we're gonna have to do this work and you're not gonna get a client right now. You probably get a relationship in three months and that might present itself as an opportunity in six to nine months. We have to learn to be more patient and play a longer game. And it has to begin with a spirit of generosity, of giving without any agenda and let's see where it goes. That's it. So the first thing that you can do is you can target, I'm speaking to RJ specifically, but it applies to everybody in this room. I only want you to find five people you wanna work with in one category. Because you need to become an expert in this category really fast, okay? So just find five people who run companies like the ones that you want to work with. And I have to caution you here, don't get all wide-eyed and say like, oh, I want to work with like a Burger King. It's like not today, tomorrow maybe, but not today. Strike a little bit above your weight class, 
but don't go for the heavyweight champion. You're gonna get creamed. It's just not gonna work, okay? You might get lucky, but most of the times, just punch a little bit above your weight class. So I want you to follow those five people. I want you to track them down on social media. I want you to turn the bell on for notifications and just anytime they do something, you know about it. You've listened to their interview, uh, you've watched their podcast, you've watched their TED talk, anywhere they've done something that you can watch for little to no money, consume, read, watch, listen to, get to know who they are, okay? And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna keep um, a document open to say problems I think that might have. And every time you see a problem, just jot it down and don't make any assumptions, just write as much as you can. Okay, now that you're following them, what you're gonna do is, because we know this, everybody is looking for a little help in marketing. Everybody. So if they post something on LinkedIn, especially on LinkedIn, you should have that bell turned on for notifications and you should be there within the first 30 minutes because there's a good chance that they're still around. It's kind of like strategic luck where you hang out by the water cooler hoping that the president walks by and you get to, to meet her. That's what you're trying to do. So if you turn on the bell for notifications, as soon as they drop something, think how you can contribute and give value to them. Now we know this from, from LinkedIn that a, a post that gets high engagement with comments gets seen by more people, okay? There's this guy, I, I, I was talking to him, he's on LinkedIn. He has grown, I don't know, 60, 80,000 followers on LinkedIn purely by putting thoughtful comments. That's his entire strategy. His name is Yasmin, okay? I forget his last name. And he comments and he sits there and he thinks about what he can write that provokes a question or additional dialogue from other people. If you do this enough times, eventually this owner is like, who is this RJ kid? This, this guy is really engaged with our brand. Your only goal is to get them to accept your LinkedIn connection request. Okay, that's it. Do not sell them something. Now do not F up the next part. And you're going to be tempted. Hire me, give me money, review my portfolio. Don't do that. Don't start a relationship by asking for something. You've shown your true face at that point. Remember that conversation? Think about how you can serve them. Just begin the relationship like how you do in real life. And if the stuff that annoys you in real life, don't do it. You're just repeating bad behavior. So make some rules for yourself. I'm comfortable with this, then I can do this. If I'm uncomfortable with this, please do not do this. So you want to sell the way that you buy. This is the next clue. Anytime some marketer does something that gets you to sit up and respond, you should put that into a swipe file. And you should probably create a database and say, okay, this was a soap company. They said this, this is what it looked like, and I didn't click right away, and this was the next thing, and the next thing, and eventually I clicked. You can reverse engineer all of this. The really great thing about the internet is almost all the code is available for you to see. I'm talking about the campaigns, who they target, you can see everything. That's how the web works. The question is, most of us, why don't we put in that work? Because we're not willing to sacrifice any of our time, effort, and energy to achieve what it is that we want. So far, so good? So you begin a relationship in an organic way, you start to have some rapport with them. This is how I hire a lot of people these days. This is how I refer people because like, damn, she's super smart, she's, do she's making these comments, like what's going on? Mo and I, unbeknownst to me, have a mutual friend, somebody he's been coaching. During a LinkedIn live audio event, this person did a sketch note. I thought it was pretty brilliant. He shared it, I reshared it, and now we're in dialogue about working together. It doesn't even take that much effort because what did the person do? As the first point of contact, they gave value. And if it's valuable to the person in the eye of the beholder, then I'm gonna reach out I'm like, man, that was really cool. What does it cost to do this? Right, we'll see where this relationship turns out. But there's this little side story here that most of you don't know. The two gentlemen, Mo and Drigo, did not know each other. I was even speaking, I was just hosting an event and these two guys jumped in an airplane, flew out. I, I, I should have told them to not come out. And they volunteered to shoot video and photography and now we're friends and they're spending the night at my house. That's how that relationship began three years ago. And they're still here because we wanna help. That's it. And most good hearted people with character, when you help them, and especially if they're in a position of power, they will reciprocate in scales beyond what it is that you give. But don't do it because it's a ploy. Don't do it because it's not true and genuine to your heart because people like me will see you and you will reveal your face. 
Now you can take this literal example for LinkedIn and apply it across any platform you want. But LinkedIn is especially unique because it shows you kind of crazy amounts of detail about who's looking at your posts and how it works. Because it's a, a platform designed for businesses to work with each other. It's not that hard.